Oh, lovely. Wood burner, good. It's a shame we've got so much to talk about because we could we could have you could have told us a bit more about that. How is it? Are you toasty warm? I'm incredibly toasty warm. I've never been so toasty warm in all of my life. Magnificent. So we've got a lot and we've got a cup of tea. Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode 11. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. And in a week when Gavin's got his new wood burner, we also have an incredible uh, amount of news to discuss. So I'm afraid I'm afraid we'll have to put the wood burner aside for today because we have today, Mark and Gavin, Pope Francis's interview in the Jesuit magazine, uh, America magazine, Archbishop Cord Leone has been talking about sex and gender. He was interviewed for The Pillar, was it, I think, Mark, this yeah. week? Yeah, for The Pillar. Uh, then you reported, Mark, on uh, Father Rutnick uh, for The Catholic Herald and a case there about maybe some covering up of allegations of abuse. And we've also had news this week about a fall in ordinations. And there's also been the news that England is no longer a Catholic country. Or Christian country. country. Well, no, mm. never, yeah, no, I'll scrap that. <laughs> oh, it's been a long while since it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it's good. yeah, okay, it's late, I'm tired. So, uh, bring, you, bring you the news from 1559. Yeah. <laughs> we'll bang up to date. <laughs> Christian, yes, anyway, you, you get me. So let's begin, I think, if we can, Mark, with Pope Francis's recent interview for America magazine. Well, uh, lots, it covered lots of ground and... Uh, I think it really gives you sort of an insight into the way that he thinks, which is useful. And again, it's this thing that um, we've talked about before of him. Like now, I, I, I don't know what you guys think, but the last week or two seems to me that there's been a real rowing back from the Vatican, from all these wacky positions. You know, you had the Synod Twitter feed putting out pictures of women priests and LGBT stuff and, you know, ropes breaking over the church with liturgy and on the bad side and, you know, LGBT on the good side and all this kind of really strange messaging. And all of a sudden, since we had the, the story where the German bishops had their ad limina and then we had the two cardinals that we spoke about last time sort of deliver a slap on the wrist, it, everything seems to have calmed down and everything seems to be a little bit more orthodox so and I think that was you could see that in this interview and as well as I mean even things like um the Vatican nativity scene which has been the source of great derision over the you know the last seven years or so um even that where we had like I think what was it a priest said to me uh today that it was uh, the high king of Angmar was one of the one of the wise men in last year's nativity so um, and we had spacemen and all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, but this year seems much more back to normal. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that was echoed in this interview where, again, like Pope Francis, he wasn't let off the hook. You know, it was by American Magazine. So it was a load of um, Jesuits, like, which is, I mean, in itself is worth talking about because mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk that he's packed the Vatican with Jesuits. Every time someone resigns from a diacastry, he seems to put another Jesuit in charge of the next thing. Jesuits have, I went to a Jesuit school, so I'm well used to that sort of, you know, there are terms bandied around in the Catholic Church like Jesuitical, um, you know, and Jesuit tricks, and because the Jesuits are well known for being complex and, you know, once upon a time extremely erudite, I have to say St Edmund Campion, you know, was a great hero of mine, uh, but you can, there's all that sort of shenanigans going on and uh, you know no one really knows what to make of it so when he's interviewed by the Jesuits you kind of expect it to be sympathetic but they didn't let him off the hook I have to say they did push on the hard questions um he answered questions about abuse racism uh you know a, a, like a broad spectrum of things mm -hmm. and you know his, his answers were, weren't too bad um the, the only I think the only sort of alarm bell that went off was on the abortion question where he seemed to separate I don't know if you guys saw it he seemed to separate mm. 
um, humanity from personhood, which is which goes against the Evangelium Vitae and Donum Vitae. Uh, Donum Vitae, I think it is. It's the other one, um, as well as just you know what everyone has always sort of taught. But some of the discussion surrounding that since then has been that um, that some of the pro-choice people use this as an argument um, about personhood and that uh, he was trying to preempt that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, like, my, I, I was sort of pushing back against that and saying, well, he wasn't speaking to any pro-abortion people. He was speaking to fellow Catholics. Mm -hmm. You think the least he could do would be clear on the fifth commandment, you know, on something that we all know is well documented. I don't think it's helpful, you know. One of the most interesting things was at the beginning, he was talking about the divisiveness in American politics and the abortion issue, uh, the conversation revolved around the way that he handled it, which is hugely controversial and links into a lot of the other things that we've sort of mentioned that we might talk about today. Um, like, for example, the Nancy, you know, that you've got President Biden and Nancy Pelosi, the, the Speaker of the House, who are both people who are very openly pro-abortion and Pope Francis has made a point of welcome, welcoming them and uh, hugely controversially giving them Holy Communion or, you know, like with with Pelosi, he basically, Archbishop Cordelioni um, said that she was to refrain from Holy Communion and then she, the next thing she appeared in the Vatican mm. um, with Pope Francis' knowledge and was given Holy Communion. So that was problematic i think is probably the best way of describing it i found this interview a real lights on moment and actually a source of great relief to me uh, like mark i thought the ambiguity over the language he used was a reflection of his take on american politics and it was the way in which i thought he was improperly i didn't agree with it at all because i can't take anything other than a than a passionate pro-human being stand in the womb so any diminution of that for the sake of not losing democrat catholics i found i found difficult somewhere somewhere between difficult and reprehensible <laughs> but the thing that helped me immensely was that what i've been really afraid of is that the, the pope has been used either as the engine of or as a stalking horse for protestant progressive <clears throat> um, philosophical categories and so to suddenly see his uh, his answers, albeit a bit eccentric, in response to the ordination of women, was just huge for me because I suddenly thought, well, okay, this is great. Despite the the German bishops, he's saying this is the question that is not open. To, it's, not, it's not open. It's a close question. And he gave some reasons. They could have been a bit more theologically astute, but they were good enough for the moment. Well, you know, this idea of the pet trial, I'm, what, I, I sort of, mm. this is not the moment to run him down. I want to praise him, not, not mm. run him yeah. down. So, yeah, I was really, I was really grateful for that clarity because this, this, this Gaia women, priestess, relativism stuff, mm. once it gets going, we know exactly how it, how it rolls. And it's, it is almost the most dangerous thing that could happen to the church. So for the Pope to say, we're not going down there was wonderful particularly as a break on what the German Snowdaway was doing. And then I think I, I, I got the gay stuff. The gay stuff seems to me, which, which is also progressive, to be essentially a kind of private, a private permissive area for him. Uh, for reasons we don't understand, he is very sympathetic. Who am I to judge? Uh, he, he gives time to, to, to gay activists, to people who are offering this highly quote pastoral ministry um and and it the, the panic for me was that this was a completely progressive seamless agenda that was going to roll through the catholic church and you know lord where else can we go only you have the words of eternal life if the catholic church goes down you know this is inconceivably problematic but it isn't going to because he's not a stalking horse for progressivism he's simply i think a, a theologically compromised uh, a pope over the gay issue who has a number of rather permeable theological areas abortion being one of them um, but who understands that catholicism is catholicism and and he's not about to sow a whole load of seeds that <clears> will <throat> become self-contradictory within the magisterium so to tell you the truth this is almost one of the most hopeful weeks i've had since i became mm -hmm. a catholic because 
uh, I saw that what he was doing was a matter of personal, I thought, incoherent idiosyncrasy and not a strategy that was going to blow us all away. Yeah, I agree. And and to be fair to, to Pope Francis, I think you, you said I'm pro-human being. And I think that was behind the choice of comments he made, because there are those who will talk about non-human persons. And so I think he was trying to get away from, and as Mark said, that maybe would not be the right audience, but uh, and clarity was needed. But I think maybe that was what he was trying to do, is to highlight the human being, uh, to avoid those uh, secular philosophers who are trying to, to identify those non-humans as persons um i thought that was very good um you, you I, I mark you've written about this on your blog and i thought what else was interesting about this is that you say he explains the way the holy spirit acts is first to cause disorder such as at pentecost and then to bring about harmony and i thought that was quite telling as well about some of the some of the it's wrong i'm glad to yeah. say this is completely yeah. it's it's so wrong. Wrong. No, it was dreadful but yeah. but don't you think that was an interesting revelation about yes. his papacy I mean, don't totally, and that's no. what I, I, I was well, well. going to say. Would it be? It'd be interesting to hear what you thought, Gavin, because um, I went for a pint with my Baptist mate last night, uh, which was, and we were talking about this. We were talking about so they they've got a a very uh, you know trip, but like Bible uh, traditional sort of Bible uh, strategy or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. I don't know. It feeds through into the Baptist tradition but um so say for example with homosexuality um and he was saying that he was saying so how do we preach the gospel to those people he said if if you had like so i was telling him you know that in the church there are lots of gay people who are part of the church and there are brothers and sisters and you know they're welcome as welcome as anyone else um but like all sins like you know no different than heterosexuals or and if you commit a sin then you're expected to go to confession before you and you know make sure that you're in a state of grace before you uh, approach the blessed sacrament it doesn't mean that you can't go into church and we were talking about um you know providing a space basically for people to hear the gospel so people come to us and if we just shut the door if we just bar the door then um you know they're never going to hear the gospel and so you know there has to be while we maintain the the ten commandments or the you know like the outer boundary of what is acceptable and what is so people know when they we speak clearly about what's right and wrong but at the end of the day we provide a space for people to come in and if you take what pope francis says about all these issues in the context of his going to the periphery stuff that i really think that's probably what like, where, like you can argue about whether it's successful or it's a bit i think it's not <laughs> And it's about clear messaging when you're the pontiff. I think that's the big problem, you know, really with the whole pontificate. But I, to be, you know, to be honest, I, I can see that it seems to me that that is what in his muddled sort of mm. confusing way, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to say, come on then, let's come in. Let's have the discussion. Let's talk about it. But we're at the point of the discussion now. Would you agree, guys, where he seems to have gone, right, but this is what the magisterium says, yeah. you know. Yeah, which is great. I'm with Gavin. It's it's a it's a good week. I'm going to use this moment. I'm afraid because to, no, to say no, it, no. <laughs> no, it, but, but it, it links on thirty to, seconds. <laughs> it, it, what? Gosh, you're pushing it. Go on, Gavin. Thirty. He shouldn't have called the Holy Spirit it. We really have to take trouble yeah. to call to call the Holy Spirit he. It, it, you're quite right. It showed a, a psychological turn of mind, a kind of the sort of the jester, the the, the trickster. Mm. Let's throw it up there. The Anglican would-be priestesses do something called messy church, where they bring all the kids in to make a mess, and then you know, it seemed to me it was a pontifical version of, of Anglican priestess messy church. It's not necessary. We don't need to do that. I understand it. I forgive him, but I, and I'm very glad he was aiming to resolve the whole matter with order. But it was a bit substandard. Mm, yeah. 28, well done. Um, that brings us to Archbishop Cordelioni, who, and this relates to this. So he was he was interviewed about um, sex and gender, and he was saying, actually, there's a, I'll read this verbatim, there's a consistency between Pope Francis' teaching on care for our common home and on gender theory. In each case, the physical dimension is gift from God, not a mere object to be made and remade according to our desires. And so he he was I thought he was very good in his interview, Archbishop Cordelioni, at, at making clear some of the things Pope Francis had been saying and relating them to these difficult questions. What did you think, Mark? 
uh, I'm sort of halfway through a blog on it where I, the first comment that I made was, oh, if only we could get this sort of clar clarity of teaching from the Vatican at the moment, you know. And Cordelione is the master at this. Yeah. He's in the hub of homosexuality, San Francisco, um, in the USA. And yet he he walks that line really carefully. He's very clear about what the church teaches, but he, he reaches out to people in a, you know, in a spirit of uh, dialogue and but in, an accompaniment without compromising. And yet he, I think he's the exemplar of the fact that you don't need to compromise to show agape, you know, to show love to our brothers and sisters. And he does it, I think in that interview, he explains that very, very well. The fact that it is loving to take this message of hope to the gospel and um, of the gospel to people, to our brothers and sisters. And that really is, I wonder if it's a lack of confidence in so many people, why they feel the need to compromise the message, because they don't really believe, you know, they, they're so keen to uh, reach out to people in love that they, they're prepared to compromise it. The other point that was really interesting in that interview is the amount that he references Pope Francis. Did mm -hmm. you notice that? And that is, uh, this is a guy who's just been publicly slighted in a massive way by Pope Francis because he put a, a, an interview on Nancy Pelosi um, about re the reception of Holy Communion. And um, Pope Francis basically went, you know, like publicly went behind his back and, and undermined him, which is, I mean, was horribly scandalous, I think, whatever way for the Pope to do. But it's his old ringing up parishioners trick isn't it and telling them that they didn't need to listen to their parish priest so like that was an in, it was interesting that he referenced him so much and so deferentially he was uh, accentuating his connection to peter i think in that wasn't he mm. i thought that the um uh to me this issue about how how much we compromise in order to get people to come close to the gospel is something that I I think I feel very strongly about, because it's a, it's a law of diminishing returns. I think I remember one of my students who came to the chapel one Sunday morning on her first day at the university, thinking it was a cinema, and she walked up the stairs just as the gospel was being read. And like Saint Francis, she was converted on the spot. It didn't matter what we did or didn't do, while whether her experiences were good or bad, the Holy Spirit pierced the heart, and that was it. What we have to do, I think, particularly over the gay thing, is we have to say. Look, the 98% of people who are heterosexual are seriously disordered. We, we, we have disordered sexuality. So we're really not preaching to you and saying we're better, superior. We're just saying all of us need our sexuality sorting out. And the, the, and, and the Christian journey is a journey of pilgrimage to Christ, where we ask him to continually work and operate on us in order to sanctify us. But there's no distinction between the heterosexual and homosexual. We're just disordered people. Now, if we say that with some kind of humility, uh, you know, evangelism is one person, one hungry person telling another hungry person where they can get some bread, uh, then we, we avoid the superego, pharisaical, telling people how to run their lives. That's what we shouldn't do. And, and I think what people are trying to do is compromise on the truth in order to compensate for pharisaism, mm -hmm. basically fix the pharisaism. Let's just say we're all sinners, come with us to Christ and, and let him sort us out. And then and we don't have to compromise, any of us, neither the straight nor the gay, uh, on, on the truth. We only have to ask constantly for, for repentance. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Here I come, back to the sacraments. Brilliantly said. Uh, uh, Cordelione, I think, does it beautifully because he, he says, so this is a quote I'm reading, uh, the church's teachings on sexuality are profoundly protective, not punitive. Just look at the destruction that comes when we do not accept our sexuality as a gift from God to be used for God's purposes. We can look all around and see the suffering that comes when people do not discipline sexual desire and put it at the service of love. Broken homes, broken lives, fatherless boys and girls, abortion, not to mention rape, abuse, molestation, sex tra trafficking. The body count of the sexual revolution is large and growing, indeed exponentially. I mean, he hits the nail on the head there, That's doesn't he? very it? good. And it's the medicine that the that the world needs at the moment, very much so. Yeah, medicine, not judgment. Yes, that's very good. Exactly that, both spot on. Yeah, brilliant. So recommend going to to dig out that interview in the pillar of Archbishop Cordelioni. Um, 
I think we'll move to two things that I think are related, which is the the recent census and a drop in ordinations. They're at their lowest. Um, I think a, a part of the problem is, um, again, goes back to formation. And I think if we look at the culture, if you're told that your opinion trumps all, your opinion matters more than anything, how can you then be expected to sacrifice? So, uh, you know, this this sort of culture has been over the past few decades has been about you matter it's your truth it's your opinion it's not it's not being deferring or being reverent or saying i've got a boss i need to listen to there was a thing simon sinak did a few years ago and he said millennials they struggle to hold down jobs because he said they go into a job and they say oh it's it's not fulfilling after eight months so they give up and what you have is 30 year olds who have had 10 different jobs and it used to be that you'd have a job and you'd stick with it and it'd be difficult and you'd wait and you'd be patient and so i think that that may be a little bit behind some of this is this this poor formation of the person to to and again i hate to say it i always do this i'm bringing it back to catholic schooling is what does it mean to form a person because you're a you're a man and a woman first before you're a banker or a lawyer or a doctor and then that impacts then on onto the priestly vocations and onto marriage breakup and so on so it's that inability to to sacrifice because you're told from a young age and increasingly so today everything you matter your opinion it's all about you it's your truth that's my little two pennies worth what do you think <laughs> gavin which question the ordinations or the census yeah so so both i mean i've put them together because i think i think they're related a drop in our christian faith a, a drop in vocations is um i've said how i i think maybe they're related but you can pull them apart well, I'd like to treat them separately and mm -hmm. to go to the one I know less, least about is ordinations. Um, I think one of the, uh, the I used to have a game when I was a, when I was a student. It involved three teams and psychiatrists, lawyers and priests. And um, I which, forgot which way around it was, but I think the psychiatrist jumped over the lawyer but was vulnerable to the priest. And, and each of them had a different vulnerability and strategy. One of the reasons for the lack of vocations is we've lost any sense of the supernatural. The mass is the most extraordinary thing conceivable in any aspect of human life and to be a priest celebrating the mass on behalf of of both with everything in time and space is is simply the most uh, astonishing vocation but because the church you know if you have half or more of the church i think it's the american church is this sure that doesn't believe in the mass uh, then then why would you want to be a priest why would you need to be why do we need priests in that case if, you know it, it, it's this quasi protestantism so I think the first thing is is that and the second thing I think is the appalling level of pastoral care in the Catholic Church. I mean, um, you've heard me say rude things about Anglicans. Well, let me tell you, Anglicans are really good with pastoral care. I, I'm very proud of the way in which uh, Anglicans exercised it. They made lots of mistakes. They didn't do it very well, but they meant it. They tried it. I've always been aghast at the at the at the, the, the desert of human kindness and responsibility, particularly for clergy. Um, and so uh, I think I think experiencing a vocation to the priesthood today would be a very difficult thing with this diminution of the supernatural uh, and and this 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 absence of of all the things you would need if you're going to go on this lonely journey as a celibate. Um, you'd need some compensations. And the problem is because there aren't any proper compensations, people have taken improper compensations. And that's one of the reasons why we have the difficulty we have. So that that's my brief brief quick response to the lack of I, I could I could make it personal but probably we shouldn't <laughs> move on to other things no. well I, and you know I think that's um, very interesting I think that you're absolutely right to say I've always thought that the, the guys I know I know one young priest who uh, uh, when he came out of seminary was you know the way that he explained it i mean he did a year at the cathedral where they kept an eye on him or whatever where he felt he was constantly you know kicked in the nuts uh, and told that he couldn't do what he wanted to do and then basically he was thrown the keys with, and, and left to get on with it somewhere you know to be a spiritual father to 800 people or whatever it's just i, I mean i'm i am constantly amazed at the courage of our priests and yet, and yet, I know so many Catholic priests who are so joyful about it. Um, and I think the answer is to look at, say, like, look at the Norbertines in Peckham 
and the beauty of the liturgy that they've got there and the fun and fraternity that they share with each other, that's how it should, you know, I mean, that's how it should be. Mm. And then it's, it's that joy is effusive and you can, uh, you can recognize it, you know, you can recognize it in the, in the parishioners and you can recognize it in the community itself. So, mm. Mark, what, do, what can you say? Do you have any comment on where the vocations are coming from when you look at that report? So there's Westminster, there's Shrewsbury, there's, um, well, some surprised of them are that higher than, and then Salford some of them were in the lead, which really surprised me. Really surprised me. But I, was, you know, I mean, they're in the lead if they had three or something like that. <laughs> so yeah. There's like no one's setting the world alight. I think what's extraordinary is that if you look at the FSSP and the ICKSP, they've got more vocations than in you know. If what you're gonna, if you align them with with a diocese, I mean, they just make them look ridiculous. They've got thirty odd men a, a year going through. They can't finance it, and I just it just amazes me that we can't learn these lessons. You know, but what's what does it mean to be a young man like any young man to be a soldier or a, a policeman or a you know a doctor? It's sacrificial, isn't it? There's a sacrificial dimension to the priesthood. Yeah. And what we've got, unfortunately, I mean, we talked about the uh, the plenary meeting of our bishops and how utterly, you know, it's just make you despondent to listen to them waffling on about absolute rubbish. You know, it's all like going to the like the most boring admin meeting in the office that you've ever been to with the most uninspirational leaders. Mm -hmm. Who are they going to attract? You t I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work it out, do you? You know, like we can link this with the uh, with the, the census. Then, with you know, I did a quite a scathing blog about Stephen Cottrell, the uh, the Archbishop of York, who um, basically had an opportunity. He was published in the Telegraph and did a, a yeah. piece. And I was well, honestly, when I clicked on it, I thought, "Oh, brilliant! The Archbishop of York. This is going to be a real mm -hmm. thing about you know the decline of Christianity and what it's what it's all about and getting the message out there, the passion and the." You know, the fantastic truth about the Christian faith. Was it? No. He could have been <laughs> opening a tin of beans and pouring it for the, all the energy and interest that there was in it. I mean, what, did you read it, Gavin? Oh, uh, yes, I did. I liked your title, The Man Who Pretends to Be Archbishop of York. I thought that was quite right. <laughs> <Did you keep? laughs> I mean, I, I'd like to say they're in denial, but it's not really in denial. They, they, It doesn't matter because they see themselves as a thin pattern of spirituality spread across an indistinguishable body politic. So they don't care how thin it is. They're, they're just there doing their thing. And they, I, I think, they don't think they understand Christianity and I don't think they understand secularism. I'm sorry to be patronizing, I don't mean to be, but it's, it's really serious. So I, I wrote a rather stronger article than the man pretending to be Archbishop of York did. Um, and I, I took two lessons from it. First of all, I think it's time that the Catholic Church woke up and decided it was going to be the established church in this country. Uh, first of all, the Anglicans, the Anglicans do weird things with their figures. They try and count them all through the week because so few people go on Sundays. But it's, it's down to 1% of the population in Anglican mm -hmm. Church on a Sunday. Uh, and this makes the secularists very cross about the fact that the uh, bishops have seats in the House of Lords. Um, there won't be the time and the energy to unravel that. It's not going to be disestablished. But essentially what the Catholic Church, which has been in awe of the establishment for all kinds of complicated reasons uh, for far too long. The fact is Anglicanism, for all it has some lovely points and some very good people and some quite holy people and some very beautiful hymns and poetry, uh, it's derivative. It, it borrows the clothes and the structures of Catholicism and then fills them with a kind of Protestantism and the mix doesn't really work and anyway it comprises of about four different spiritualities who are in a very difficult standoff coalition with each other it's not a very good way of doing things and and it's lost its way so now the, there is a space for a for a church that embodies the christian character of the nation and it should be the catholic church because the catholic church did it for a thousand years it built all the buildings it did all the liturgies it built all the hospitals it set all the patterns for education it did the whole template until it was until it was a state robbery <laughs> well it should step back up and do that and if the catholic church doesn't see it has responsibility to, to do it it's really failing on the job it's a very significant moment at now and the catholics can either do 
the same thing as a man pretending to be archbishop and say oh well we're all going down quietly it doesn't matter this will be a slow evaporation uh i don't need to worry about it or they can step up to the mark and fight and the other reason they need to fight is because to go for the moment when you were in a majority to a minority in a democratic culture is really significant mm. all the ethics that matter the stuff that brings coherence that Cordelioni just described as opposed to destruction which Cordelioni described they're all Christian ethics and the only way we have a mandate to argue for them is if either we can prove they're better and or the more of us or we've just lost half the argument because there aren't more of us anymore so that means we're going to have to work even harder to prove they work in the face of a self-deceptive hedonism that's a very big uphill task uh, it's going to make life very difficult but tom holland has been good at this next bit he describes the secular the national secular society and the the, eighth, the new atheism as a like a man sitting on a tree with a saw sawing the branch off forgetting completely that he's going to fall to the ground because the tree is supporting the branch he's trying to cut off there is no secular humanist new atheist agreed pattern for communal ethics they're just not there we've only got neo-paganism on one side and two kinds of brands of totalitarianism left and right on the other and they're not very nice any of those are not very nice and if we want to see just how unnice they are look at the way that wokeism handles cancel culture there is no forgiveness there's no coming back they can dig into your past 40 years ago find one association one remark and you're out forever if we we what we have as christians in terms of forgiveness and the, the dignity of the human person and the conscience it's so precious and so enormous and if we don't put it back into society then then we're going to find the end of this civilization is going to be a, a really very terrible affair we've had we've had the most appalling glimpses in the 20th century both behind the iron curtain in russia and 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 behind the barbed wire of auschwitz in germany we know what the totalitarianism looks like. Neo-paganism is not much fun either. Um, so this is the moment not to do what the man pretending to be Archbishop of York did this week, but to say we've just entered one of those tipping points that all the eco ecologists are terrified of. The reason they're going bananas and having their eyes pop out as they glue themselves to the M25 is because they think, I think wrongly, but they think that we've reached a tipping point. And if we have, it's a really, really serious matter. Well, ecologically, I don't think we have. Spiritually, we certainly have. And that's one of the reasons why we have to respond to this census with, with a clear-eyed determination to live the gospel and to preach the gospel and to share it as the very best of our predecessors did. Because otherwise, our civilization is going into darkness and taking our children and grandchildren with it. Well, there was another symptom of that today when uh, Saji Javid stood up in the House of Commons and said, uh, you know, was arguing about the fact that um, so many young people are committing suicide now before the age of 30 or something like that. Yeah. And how you could not connect the, that to, the, you know, this, the census and the, the fact yeah. that if you remove all the meaning from life, if you remove all the beauty and the dignity and the, the you know, the purpose, you know what is there left your computer games having sex with as many people as you can on a friday night yeah. throwing as much I, vodka down your neck you know that's I, all that's I, left I have, isn't it? I, I have to be as careful as i can i get i get a number of opportunities to go on the or to say things on the media um, one of the things i try and find a way of saying is you know this mental illness amongst your children how's it working out for you yeah, yeah. where do you think it came from because in my generation when we when we we supported the young with a structured security that they didn't like they kicked against a great deal but nonetheless we acted parentally in the right way by giving people the right safety in order to know which traces you could kick over and which you haven't so now you now you've um like the hate's wonderful book on the uh the molly coddling of the uh, of the american mind now you've tried these other ways of getting rid of christian ethics how just how's it working out for you with you for you with yeah. the with the um not in the abortion rates but the, the dreadful suicide rates and 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 the appalling degrees of mental health and troubles one can't talk about this triumphalistically because it's so absolutely terrible mm. but the whole trans thing is an outburst of very serious mental illness mm. and 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 people can't even call it for what it is and so the reason i i, I feel so passionate about this is because 
we shouldn't have to be forced to defend Christian ethics as if they were some kind of repressive straitjacket. They're the stuff that keeps people from killing themselves and keeps our children relatively sane instead of what they are now. Uh, and, and once again, Christians have to find a way, I think, of trying to make a case for the ethics as as protection. But, you know, Cordini was so right. Was it, was it he? You know, medicine, not judgment. Mm. We're bringing medicine, medicine with these ethics. But but if if you don't have if the Archbishop of York or the man who pretends to be you know, can't grim glimpse of it. Well, you're not going to hear it from the Anglicans. You might still, with the catechism, hear it from the Catholics. Mm. Well, you hear it from us anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> I th what terrifies me, and I think you kind of, you, like you really got to this point in your article in the Herald about this, Gavin, was the way that they're so desperate to rapidly deconstruct everything that has worked for us. Um, I'm trying to think now, is it Oscar Hayek calls that the fatal conceit of our generation mm. and that they've got, you know, they, they want to step over the steps of construction that have, and structure that have allowed us to stand on the shoulders of giants and reach for the stars. And they think that they can do that without having to observe any of the rigor or restrictions or, you know, boundaries that, that every generation has worked for every generation before. They've got no discipline and no vision they've got no understanding of why that's important and they just want to deconstruct everything and they've got no idea what they're going to put in place instead of it which yeah. takes us back to what Catherine was saying about about the millennials and gen z yeah. and, and mm. incapacity to deliver yeah i was talking with a teacher today and he was saying you, you, what happens now is you get 11 year olds 10 year olds nine year olds coming and saying uh being encouraged to write an opinion you know share your opinion on this and you think i'm not interested in your opinion you're nine you need to learn something you know you need to learn the wisdom that's been passed down for generations then i'm interested in your opinion but to come to, to say to young people that's all that matters yeah it, it ties up for sure but gavin your piece was brilliant in the catholic herald and uh you've you, you've said quite a, a lot about it here but it's definitely worth going to read read that Thank you. um if it's a choice between that and the so-called archbishop of where york <laughs> <laughs> He's a Leon C boy as well. He's from the same as I am. But... Um, I think we've got time just briefly then um, to, to go to the, the article you wrote, Mark, if you'd like to tell us a bit about this, which is a story that broke in Italy and you've brought it here and written about it for the Herald, which is about this priest, Father Rupnik. Yeah, so a Slovenian uh, priest who was part of this. It was like the spiritual director for this congregation of nuns, this uh, you know um group of nuns in slovenia 20 years ago and there was like ongoing like sort of abuse allegations coming out of it um and it, i think it was swept under the rug to a large extent uh like the report that i did in the herald was just a report because this is the sort of thing that can be quite dangerous um but there are but basically now it's all it's come to light because he was it seems like his ministry has been suppressed the jesuits have come have confirmed that um but he's carried on basically he's carried on in public ministry because he's the guy who did the three-eyed jesus the horrible thing for the oh, yeah. did you see that horrible <laughs> i mean if you wanted a, an idea that there was something wrong with him you only had to look at that really i thought um so uh, it's interesting one of the interesting things about it is that there's also been uh some reports from steubenville sadly um mm, yeah. the catholic university the franciscan university and I think it's, uh, you know, I wanted to, I just wanted to sort of say that um, we tend to sort of cling to our ideologies, our preferred ideologies and say, ah, oh, well, that's because they're liberals or that's because they're trads or, you know, whatever faction you want to, but abuse doesn't work that way. Abuse crosses all these boundaries and these people will align themselves with whatever ideology gives them access to, you know, people to abuse, to vulnerable people, children, worst of all. Um, and surely we've learned that lesson now that it's, you know, um, it, it's, it, it crosses all those boundaries. And Pope Francis said that in his interview. Um, you know, I, it was hard to read what he said, but what he said was right about abuse. That he said that, you know, it goes on most of all in the family. This is where we see the most reported cases. And actually in the Catholic Church, the percentages are much lower than in society. You know, a fraction of a percent that we see in society. But the Pope said that is unacceptable. Just one case is unacceptable. And obviously it's the hypocrisy that highlights it. 
Mm. So um, despite the fact that the Pope says all these things, it then looks like he has got this penchant for letting people off and promoting people and, you know, other, and the the press don't seem particularly interested in pursuing any of these things. I mean, you can run them off your fingers now. Zanchetta, Grazi, Rica, you know, Coco Palmeri, Maria, Mel, Coco Palmerio. He had a funny hat. Did you see his funny hat? Anyway, um, so yeah, there's a, so there's a he sort of surrounded himself with a big gang of them, um, and a lot of people have speculated that's because he finds them easy to manipulate. Maybe he's trying to rehabilitate them. I don't know, but it looks like this Rupnik who was incarnated into Rome then got involved. Um, you know, in in this sort of high profile, uh, doing paintings for different people. He's been very prolific in America, ex especially, and he's a Jesuit. And uh, as a result of that, when he was apparently a uh, Messi and Latino, have said, have reported that he was excommunicated as a result of the investigation into him. And Pope Francis quashed that uh, excommunication. So within within half an hour, mm. incredible. So, not good so, news. Not good news, <laughs> unfortunately. So, we, we began with good news and we've ended with not so good news. <laughs> but uh, such is life. Um, we continue to pray. Uh, I think we'll have to leave it there for, for now and um, go and find a spiritual equ equivalent of gluing ourselves to the M25. Uh, to... <laughs> well, Cardinal Muller's in uh, London at the Oratory. Yes. Uh, tomorrow night so i'm going to be there <laughs> i don't know if we can get this out in time but I, I i will try but i i can't actually i'm i'm doing some work with uh archbishop john wilson so i'd like to be there it's cardinal muller or archbishop john wilson <laughs> you do in demand <laughs> um like but yeah you, hopefully you'll report back to us on that yeah it's a long yeah. way to cycle from the welsh marches as well isn't it Gavin? Uh, yes, it would be a very long way. It would indeed. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. Although he's he's worth it, I hear. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. Yeah, well, I'm maybe sure. we'll discuss that next next week when we when we meet again. Right. So, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please continue to do so and share and subscribe and everything else. And I am um, have been and still am Catherine Bennett. And I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Thank you for listening. God bless you. <laughs>